the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today, the uh, February 22nd, uh, we have the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter. Uh, this is a second-class feast uh, in, in the church, uh, but a first-class feast for the uh, fraternity of St. Peter. So a great feast day for us. Um, and it is really a feast of the uh, authority of the Pope as handed on by Christ. Um, uh, the chair of St. Peter uh, is, is chair in Latin is cathedra. Uh, so that's where the, you get the cathedral is the seat of the bishop, uh, uh, symbolizing his, his seat comes from, uh, from Rome. And of course, the chair of Peter, uh, where he sat, um, uh, holds authority because it was given to him by Christ in Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse 16, which we will explore and some others. Uh, so Christ uh, leaving a vicar in his stead to um, manage his house until he returns right, at the second coming. So that, that is the uh, kind of the idea, the essence of the feast for today. Uh, before we go into that, uh, just uh, comes some, uh, I guess, honorable mentions today for our saints. We have St. Ariston, who was one of Jesus's 72 disciples. Right? We hear of he sent 72 disciples out to preach and to heal the sick and even to raise the dead. So here we have one of them. And he preached in Cyprus, uh, island off of Greece, and was ended up being a martyr. Uh, we also have Blessed Isabella of France, and she was a sister to King St. Louis IX. And like her brother, she, though she was born into the, the royal household, she was a princess, but lived a life of uh, a poverty dedicated to God. She had turned down a marriage with the Emperor of Germany to found a convent of poor, poor Clare nuns near Paris. So a great example from the sister uh, of, of a great king, King Louis the Ninth. So they had both had wonderful, uh, wonderful parents. Um, uh, Louis, I think they called them Louis the Twelfth, Louis the Pious, and then their mother Blanche. Um, also today, um, one of the uh, we would say a great story of a penitent woman, Margaret of Cortona. She was in the 1200s, uh, daughter of a farmer. Her mother died. Stepmother ignored her. She became uh, the mistress to a nobleman for nine years. Had a child. He later got murdered, dumped into a ditch. Ugh. That kind of changed her life. She went back to her father. Um, he wouldn't have her. He threw her out. Uh, she was ridiculed uh, from people who had known what she had uh, done. Uh, given shelter by Franciscans. And she had trouble with purity still, but eventually uh, became a Franciscan tertiary and assisted the poor, uh, lived on alms, developed an intense prayer life, and ended up much later founding a hospital, uh, gathering a group of women. Uh, they didn't take vows. It wasn't a convent. But uh, they, they did charitable works. They worked at the hospital. And eventually, by the end of her life, she was receiving visions and having uh, ecstasies in prayer. So what a change from, from a, a horrible uh, beginning. And she even suffered calumny for the rest of her life because of, of her earlier days. So that's St. Margaret of Cortona uh, from the 12th, uh, 13th century. Uh, also, I've been noticing, actually, I'm going through uh, catholicsaints.info, a, a wonderful site with all, all the saints for each day listed there. I've been noticing a lot of saints from World War I and II, uh, or rather World War II, uh, not saints, but more like blessed, uh, priests and nuns, especially uh, put in concentration camps and dying there uh, or, or having preached out against the Nazi occupation. Uh, so I've been noticing a lot of those. I've, I've been kind of um, uh, skipping them because, um, well, they're, they're, maybe they're more recent, they're more modern, but I, I just have to mention the, um, the number of them that I've been noticing. Uh, I may start actually um, mentioning some of those uh, because it was it was a Catholic church in Germany that opposed the Nazi party. When you look, actually, I, I saw an interesting, um, oh, uh, it was a breakdown of like by county or by, I don't know what they call them, uh, regions in Germany, like our counties. Um, and there's a completely inverse proportion to those counties which were Catholic and the counties which voted for the Nazi party. The counties that were Catholic, almost to a single one voted against the Nazi party. All the counties that were Protestant voted for the Nazi party. So very interesting. Um, but anyways, today, Blessed Richard Hanks is the, is the priest, World War II, uh, and he died in Dachau uh, from typhoid while assisting other prisoners. Um, oh, something to point out too, last one, from uh, the 20th, Saturday the 20th. I mentioned it was a feast of Blessed Jacinta Marto. Uh, also on some calendars, it is the feast of um, her, her, her brother uh, Francisco. So Francisco and Jacinta Marto, uh, both can be celebrated on that day. But also in other calendars, uh, Francisco has his own feast on 4 April as well. So depending on which calendar, you'll get um, different saints. So that was um, uh, pointed out to me by one of my <laughs> uh, listeners, I suppose, one of the people who listens to these sermons. 
So um, that's great. Good feedback. Um, good to know those those distinctions. Uh, okay, so for the feast for today, the chair of St. Peter. Uh, St. Peter, uh, it's actually not Rome that's the oldest uh, diocese or our bishopric, we could say. It is Antioch. Antioch is the first place where Peter went, and he was bishop there for about uh, almost 10 years, from 44 to 53 AD. And after leaving uh, Jerusalem, which is where he was with the other apostles, um, James the Less, uh, I guess, would, would have been placed as bishop there in Jerusalem. So, I mean, who knows exactly how that worked out. I mean, this is all brand new, just being figured out. But St. Peter, when he goes to Antioch, uh, James adjusts stays in Jerusalem. He is in Antioch for ten, almost 10 years, and then he goes on to Rome. Um, by the way, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, one of our apostolic fathers uh, who wrote the letters to the Smyrnians, letters to the um, you know, Corinthians, those, those seven letters on his way to martyrdom, he was a third bishop of Antioch. So it was, it was, uh, blessed, um, it was the Apostle Peter. Uh, he left in 53. Then it was Evodius from 53 to 69, and then Ignatius of Antioch, 70 to the year 108 or so, 102 and some, some calculations. Um, so, uh, so we have, we have, right, we have that, we have that apostolic succession. There we go. Um, uh, uh, again, another, um, testament to the foundations of our faith, the truth of it, as we'll even see with papal infallibility. So uh, Peter then goes to Rome. Uh, now these two, you'll find in some, some missiles, these two, um, I guess, sees or seats commemorated. On the 18th of January uh, is the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter at Rome, and then today, February 22nd, is the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter at Antioch. And so um, I think representing the, the date that he, um, um, he arrived or, or um, uh, took um, or you know, established himself. And eventually it was combined into one, the chair of St. Peter, uh, just the chair of St. Peter. And the feast day was chosen at, on today, the 22nd, uh, in, mem in memory of uh, Antioch as being, being the first. And I think that was like, because much later on, Antioch, you know, they have the patriarchs of Antioch, the patriarch of Jerusalem. Even now, these are bishops who have great standing in the church. And so it's kind of almost like a... Um, a, a political gesture to, um, I don't think they're orthodox, but the, the, like the, the Byzantine tradition, the Greek tradition is, yes, you know, we recognize, um, uh, you know, the, the ancient um, establishment of Antioch. I, I think that is the, um, uh, Greek. Uh, so let's see. A Christ the king, head of the world, head of the church, left in place a steward and as one man who controls his house and his kingdom, and that is good leadership. Um, any, anybody... Um, who is in a leadership position knows this, right? You, you have one guy in charge. Even if it's a huge place, there needs to be one person um, running everything. It doesn't have to make all the decisions, but that's the ultimate authority. And so that is what Christ did for St. Peter. And of course, this comes from Matthew chapter 16, 16, um, when Christ asks his apostles, who do others say that the Son of Man is? And they, they tell him what other people are saying. Some say the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he wants an act of faith. Who do you say that I am? And of course, I'm in Peter being the boldest. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answers, answers him and says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Yonah, for uh, you've been inspired by the Holy Ghost, right? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And this, this is where he transmit to him the authority. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He also mentions this, that the binding and loosing, when he breathes on the apostles in John chapter 22, uh, giving to them the authority to forgive sins. Uh, but we have some, uh, some important imagery there, which is, I will give you the keys. Keys and binding and loosing. But keys open things, right? And he just mentioned gates, right? The gates of heaven and the gates of hell. And keys open things. Uh, now, this, this imagery is not, this is not the first time that's been used in Scripture. Uh, we go back and we'll see in Isaiah chapter 22, uh, when God inspires the prophet Isaiah to take away the authority from a bad steward and give it to another one, uh, he uses the imagery of keys, of opening and closing. Uh, with, and that, that is a sign of authority. And so this is, uh, Shebna was one of the stewards during the time of Jerusalem. This is the, the divided kingdom. And the Assyrian army is coming, and he's supposed to be getting the, the city ready for a siege uh, to, to defend itself. And instead, 
he's building a great and grand tomb for himself, which was a status symbol at the time. So completely misusing his authority and his position, and God sends a prophet to uh, take his authority and give it to another. Uh, thus says, and this is Isaiah twenty-two fifteen. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to this steward to Shebna, who is a master of the house, and say to him, What right do you have here? And who are your relatives here? Are you cutting a tomb out for yourself? Um, this is the, the, the kings would do this, and here he was a steward, uh, so kind of a usurpation of authority. The Lord is about to hurl you away violently. He will seize firm hold on you, whirl you round and round, and throw you like a ball into a wide land, and there you shall die. Now, that's, that's a curse. That's the taking away of authority. And now he, here he is giving it to another. On that day, I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and, he will, and will clothe him with a robe and bind your sash on him, and I will commit your authority to his hand, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David, and he shall open, and no one shall shut, and he shall shut, and no one shall open. So some Old Testament, um, we'd say, corroboration to the uh, claim of, of, uh, of Catholics from uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Christ gave to St. Peter authority uh, using the imagery of keys, of opening and closing, of binding and loosing. But we're not done. Uh, there's also the imagery of the seat, right? The cathedra. Remember that? Uh, so this is the fe feast of the seat of St. Peter. And even that is mentioned in the scriptures. We have Matthew chapter 23. Uh, and this is in Matthew chapter 23 is when Christ is excoriating the Pharisees for their corruption, uh, for their hypocrisy. And, I mean, it goes on for an entire chapter. I mean, it, it's, it's vicious. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites. Verses... 23, 25, 27, 29. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How can you escape being sentenced to hell? This is the whole chapter is filled with imprecations against the Pharisees. And yet, how does the chapter begin? Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses's seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. Wow. So we even have there in the Old Testament a kind of a infallibility of authority uh, because the scribes and the Pharisees, they, everybody knew what the law of Moses was. And they were actually, I mean, they were preaching the law of Moses, even though they were inventing all manner of ways to get around it. Uh, so they, that's why he calls them hypocrites. Um, and that's very similar to today, right? You have the magisterium of the church and everybody knows, right? All these apologists, Catholic Catholics know if you search you can find what the church teaches and has taught for thousands of years. Um, and, and, and that can't be denied. The bishops and even, even you know, uh, the, the current pope, they, they can try to get around it as much as they want, but they have to be ambiguous, right? They can't come out and say, that's not true. We don't teach that anymore because they know they can't not, they, they can't contradict the church. So kind of a similar thing to um, at the time of Christ, the Pharisees, they knew they couldn't change the law of Moses. And, and in fact, they were preaching it clearly but as I mentioned, they were they were getting around it. Their hearts were completely uh, corrupted. And so you have that with, with bishops today, uh, evil bishops, just like the evil Pharisees from before, they're trying to get around the doctrine of, of the church because they, they, they can't deny it. They can't contradict it. Uh, uh, but to uh, return to, um, I guess, our original point, which was the imagery used, right? We have the imagery of a seat, a cathedra, and, and Moses' seat is a sign of his authority. And also keys are mentioned in... Uh, this chapter as well. It's verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. You do not go in yourselves, and when others are going in, you stop them. Right? So there's an image of, of locking and, and opening with and keys. So all of that, right? Keys, a seat, uh, authority, um, opening and closing, binding and loosing, authority on earth, authority in heaven. It, there's multiple places in scripture that support the Catholic doctrine of papal infallibility. And uh, we would even say... Um, apostolic supremacy. Christ gave authority to the apostles and specifically to one Peter himself, which is why all, all religions and all men and all nations need to be under the authority of the Pope, right? The spiritual authority of the Pope and even the Pope himself. We saw in that Old Testament example, if there's a bad steward, God will send a prophet, right? God will take it away from the steward and give it to another. Um, God doesn't send prophets anymore um, uh, uh, like to correct the papacy. Uh, the Holy Ghost uh, uh, um, influences it directly. And so I would say on this feast of St. Peter, that is something that we can we can rest assured of, is that it doesn't matter how bad the Pope is, uh, God is in control. 
And just like God waited to send Isaiah until the right time, and, you know, this, this evil steward Shebna had been squandering and wasting time, and he'd gotten, who knows, pretty far along in his construction of his tomb, his monument to himself, uh, before God sent Isaiah to stop him. So who knows how far God will allow a bad pope to go before he removes his authority and gives it to another. Uh, but ultimately, God is in charge, and we need not worry that the, the chair of St. Peter, uh, the apostolic succession, will be, um, you know, broken or... Um, I, I wouldn't say corrupted, but I would say uh, contradicted, right? You, you can't, uh, dogma will not, dogma, uh, will not be uh, changed. Um, uh, error cannot be established as dogma. And, and that is, we would say, kind of the point of the feast of today is that the, God himself has promised the authority to Peter, promised safety and security and safeguard. He didn't say it would be easy, uh, but he did promise security. The gates of hell will not prevail. Uh, there will not be a final victory against the church. Uh, so that's what we need to remember, is that no matter how things bad get, um, the, the battle still goes on until our victory is complete, and we will be victorious. So always, always keep that in mind, and no matter how bad the world gets and things get, we are going to be victorious. Even if we never see it, it's going to happen. So let us thank God for having given us uh, the church, and pray for the intercession of St. Peter and all holy popes uh, in these um, to strengthen us, right? Strengthen the church uh, in these dire times when it seems darkness is, is uh, pretty much everywhere, even to the very top, even to the chair of St. Peter itself. Uh, let us pray for um, uh, the Pope, for his conversion, and uh, continued, um, I would say, faith uh, by, by that faithful remnant that is left. Uh, may, may their faith be strengthened. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.